Good afternoon. I'm Autumn Shook, the Inspection Manager uh, for KDA Food Safety Program. Thank you for joining our third of our monthly food safety webinar series presentations. We have a lot to cover, so let's get to it. I do need to go through some housekeeping so that you'll know how to input your questions. So um, number one in housekeeping is that all the participant microphones are going to be muted through the webinar. Uh, you may submit your questions during the presentation by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We encourage that questions be typed in during the presentation to get the Q&A started. Um, questions and comments will be monitored and answered by our team. Uh, regulatory considerations covered today are only those ap applicable to those operating in Kansas. Our 30-minute webinar will go quickly. Today's session will be recorded and posted online. After this session, you're gonna receive an email uh, with a link to the webinar recording and some resource materials that might interest you. But most importantly, the email is going to contain a link to a survey and we would appreciate you taking some time uh, to feed, give us some feedback for future ideas for our outreach. Uh, we have three speakers presenting today. This team is based out of the Northeast area of the state. We have Michael Turner, Pat Parker, Richard Kellogg, on the team to present. And so let's hear from Michael first. I'm Michael Turner. As an inspector for the last five years, I've spent time working in all sorts of retail food operations. And one of the trends we've seen over that time is an increased interest in mobile operations. While the current food truck trend in America goes back a little over a decade, preparing food on the go has been a part of Kansas life since the early days. Some of the first mobile operations were chuck wagons, which traveled with cowboys on cattle drives. Food vendors have always been a part of life in cities and towns. A Topeka was where Fred Harvey began his career with the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. Those Santa Fe dining cars were known both for the quality of food and service as they rolled across the western U.S. The food truck business is more popular than ever, and more and more operators are choosing to be mobile there are benefits to choosing a mobile food operation. Often there's a lower startup cost compared to opening a brick and mortar restaurant. Then there's the flexibility, which comes from mobility. You can go to your customers. You don't have to wait for them to come to you. Mobility can be a powerful advantage, but power comes with a price. The price of choosing a mobile operation is a lot like being the genie in Disney's movie Aladdin. Phenomenal cosmic power, itty bitty living space. You're going to take an entire restaurant and shrink it to a couple hundred square feet or maybe even less. And the challenge of making all of that fit impacts almost every aspect of your business. Making it work begins with a good layout. When you're in the middle of a rush, you don't want people tripping over each other to get their work done. And you want to make sure the person cooking has easy access to the hand sink. The equipment you have and the menu you serve must go hand in hand. There won't be space for a piece of equipment that isn't necessary. Thinking about how to use vertical space is critical in a mobile operation. Whether it's for storage or drying dishes, you'll probably use every bit of available wall space. And your menu may be a lot simpler than a restaurant menu. In my opinion, the operators we see with fewer food safety issues are ones who limit their menu and then execute those items well. You may have five or six items on a menu instead of 20 or 30. That's life in an itty bitty space. But you still have power and that power is flexibility. You may be able to build a menu with three or four core items and then change out others depending on the situation. For example, you may want kid-friendly food when you're at a school carnival on Saturday afternoon, but you probably won't need to worry about kid-friendly choices outside a bar on a Friday night. This will help overcome the lack of space. You'll be limited on cold holding capacity, and that limited cold holding space may make it hard to keep raw animal proteins separated from ready-to-eat foods. No matter how much you simplify, and no matter how well you use every inch of your mobile operation, there may be a point where no amount of cosmic power can make it all work 
in your itty bitty space. You may need home base. And the first thought a lot of people will have is to work from home. If you have space at home, you may use it to store extra supplies, such as paper goods. But the Kansas Food Code prohibits storage or preparation of food for sale out of a home kitchen. And any activities in the home must be in a space that is separate from personal use areas. This is where commercial commissaries may come in. Commissaries for a mobile unit can vary about as much as units themselves. It could be as simple as finding a restaurant where you can work something out to use their sinks for washing dishes at the end of your day. If all you're doing is wear washing, all you'll need is documentation from the owner that says you're able to use that facility for wear washing. But if you're going to need more, such as space for food storage or even a complete kitchen for prep, that facility will need a license of its own. It's not covered by your mobile unit's license. If you already own a licensed facility and are adding a mobile operation, you may use that kitchen as a commissary. If you're working out of a shared space or building out a standalone commissary space, it will need a separate license in addition to your mobile operation. No mobile operation protects you from the elements like a building will. Weather and pests are going to be more of a challenge, especially if all you have between you and Mother Nature is a tent. Screening to keep insects away from food will be essential, and you may need something to cover the ground if you're not working on a smooth and hard surface. Our May webinar will focus on pest control in retail food operations. Join us then, and we'll have more details on keeping pests out of your operation. Water is vital to any food operation, but when you're working on the go, keeping the water flowing may mean a lot more than simply turning on a faucet. In a few minutes, Richard Kellogg will be here to talk about some of the challenges of keeping water flowing in your mobile operation. But first, Patricia Parker is going to talk to you about keeping hot food hot and cold food cold while you're working on the go. Thanks, Michael. Hey, congratulations on your decision to join the food truck industry. According to iBizWorld, as of January this year, over 24,000 food trucks are operating in the U.S., with 510 active mobile units listed in our own records here in Kansas. Licensing information is on our website, and once licensed with KDA, you can travel to events across the state or operate locally. Just be sure to check with the local codes and know where you can operate before you operate. What will you offer? Shaved ice, coffee, ice cream in a warm weather seasons, or maybe a full service menu all year round. Earlier, Michael talked to you about size. So don't prepare too much at one time for your storage capacity, whether it's cold or hot. If preparing and cooking on the spot, this means it's always fresh, right? But there may not be enough time if an unexpected rush happens. An option could be to cook ahead of time in the mobile unit and freeze portions in a small chest freezer on board. Just like February's webinar said, reheat to 165, maybe on your cooktop, and store in your steam table. Serve when orders are placed. You'll be known for fast service with great food. Placement of your equipment is important, like your refrigerator unit next to the grill. It can be difficult to keep those foods at the proper temperatures. Just something to think about when you're planning your mobile kitchen workflow and air conditioning isn't just for personal comfort. It's about hygiene and food safety. You see, in such an itty bitty space inside your rig, it can get hot with everything going on. Air conditioning helps keep refrigeration equipment running correctly and cold foods at the right temperature. Something we as inspectors see a lot of are home style refrigerators. Unlike commercial equipment, they can't maintain cold holding temperatures when the doors are opened a lot. Commercial refrigeration units maintain and recover quicker when letting hot air in and cold air out each time the doors are opened. Recommended temperatures are between 36 and 38 degrees, keeping your foods cold enough while opening the doors frequently or going through a defrost cycle. Time as a public health control may be an option to monitor temperatures less and decrease the number of times opening your refrigeration. Take out enough to last through the rush, use it or throw it away. Four hours out of temperature control, cold or hot, is the maximum time to help people from getting sick. Transportation is just as important as daily operation. 
when traveling to events or across town, how will you keep your foods at the proper temperature? Hot or cold, successful holding temperatures can be done electrically by wiring your rig to be powered by the engine. With the use of something insulated to hold whatever temperature you must maintain for a short amount of time or maybe running a generator. Check with your vehicle mechanic or an RV technician. They're good resources. Now, before traveling, the refrigeration equipment needs to be on and up to temperature before you disconnect the unit and begin travel. Everything should stay cold for a few hours, but exactly how quickly food will warm up will vary a lot. Know your equipment's capabilities. Remember to monitor temperatures with ambient thermometers. We also want to think about securing your items in the cabinets, drawers, off the countertops, and even your refrigerator doors. Standard cabinet catches may not be enough to keep the doors closed and the magnetic seals on the refrigerator doors may not do the trick either. There are a wide variety of solutions. Check your local hardware stores for latches and maybe take a look at child security products. This unit is an earthquake on wheels. Everything shakes, rattles, and rolls. Secure it all or when you get where you're going, it will be a mess you never thought possible. Events usually have a plug-in power source. This is called shore power. Be sure to have good surge protection wherever you plug into shore power, or it can be a costly fix if something happens. Generator use is common in the mobile food industry. Some use this as a main power source, power source when traveling, or as their backup if other sources of power fail. It happens. Loud generators are annoying. You could get complaints or worse, they don't let you set up there anymore, and eating is a social event, so noise is a challenge. Please make sure exhaust is vented safely away from your open windows and customers. You know, some of the newer generators are much quieter, but if you have an older generator, there are noise dampening boxes on the market to help you with that. You may also consider solar as an option. You know, just research and decide what is right for you. Will you be using propane for any of your equipment or maybe for a heat source during the colder months to help keep your water pipes from freezing? Later, Richard will talk to you about protecting your water. Know how much propane you use and how often you need to fill or exchange your tanks. Check out the local area options before you travel there or transport extra bottles, but never transport full propane bottles on the inside of your vehicle. Your local fire department can help you with the propane safety and regulations. If you are transporting hot foods, do so without using an open propane source. Murphy's Law is inevitable. Be prepared. Ultimately, we are talking about food safety and you staying in operation. Hot or cold, using something insulated for a short amount of time is an option. Bags of ice or dry ice are other sources for cold holding. Stop and think, can I run on reduced power or no electricity at all? Does no power shut me down? As you monitor food temperatures, when food enters the temperature danger zone, use time as a control for food safety. Use it or throw it away at the end of four hours. This is your safest method, making sure people won't get sick from foods not hot or cold enough. There are multiple ways to achieve and maintain food safety as you deliver a quality product. Ambient thermometers help monitor temperatures and use food probe thermometers to spot check throughout the day. Remember, thermometers are one of your best friends. Properly calibrated, they will never steer you wrong. Now Richard Kellogg will be talking to you next about an essential part of operation, water. Richard? Thank you, Pat. In this section, I will cover water source capacity and disposal. When you're traveling to events, how will you know if the water you're using is safe? All city and rural water systems are monitored by the Kansas Department of Health and Environment and are approved water sources. But all water sources are not the same in taste. I have provided two websites on the KDA's webpage that can be used to review water quality reports in Kansas. If your water source is your private well, have the water tested annually for nitrates, total coliforms, and fecal coliforms. KDHE is a great resource for water testing. You may also contact your county extension office for testing. Water quality may affect the taste of your food. 
If you're using the water at the event location, think about adding a filter system to your unit. Now, let's think about capacity. You'll need water for hand washing, cleaning, and cooking. Needs will vary on the types of food you're preparing and selling. Wear washing will use most of your water, and the wash water temperature needs to be not less than 110 degrees. Will you be able to fill the wash sink and still have hot water for the rinsing and hand washing? If not, you may want to think of these ideas to conserve water. Have extra utensils to wash at the end of operation hours. Single use pans to throw away. Or have a commissary, as Michael mentioned earlier. Use of knee pedals or foot controls on the hand sink will save water during hand washing. Point of use water heaters eliminates waiting for 100 degree water. If you're in a tent operation, heating water and use of a portable hand sink is required. But just keep this in mind that Clorox type wipes and hand sanitizer does not replace hand washing. When cooking with raw foods, try to use utensils and store them properly so that the handle is not contaminated instead of washing hands between each glove change. Use the spray bottle versus the bucket. Spray bottles maintain sanitizer strength longer than the bucket. The solution in the bucket may have to be changed more often than every four hours, depending on the concentration you started with and the food debris in the solution after you use it. By using a spray bottle, the solution has less chance of being degraded by use. Please use your test strips regularly to determine strength. Always be prepared. If the water heater goes out, have a large pot to heat the water and thermal container with a free flowing spigot for hand washing. Have a long enough food grade water hose to fill your tank or have extra water tanks. Make sure everything is food grade material by locating this symbol. Sewage and other liquid waste must be removed from the mobile unit to an improved waste servicing area without creating a public health hazard or nuisance. No wastewater may be allowed to drain onto the ground. Look for this symbol for safe disposal sites. Ask the event holder about these sites beforehand. If you're at an event where you can't move your unit, think about having a portable dump tank so that you can continue operations without having backup of sewage or wastewater. As Pat mentioned earlier, are you going to be operating in cold weather? Just like your house, you must stop the cold air from getting to your water tanks and pipes or you will not have water. These are some possible solutions. Skirting, heat tape, a heater, insulate those exposed pipes, insulate the underbelly, but check with a local RV service center for more information. We've only touched a few of the challenges mobile units face every day. If you ever have any questions about safety in your operation, please feel free to contact your inspector. We're always happy to help you operate both safely and successfully. If you don't know your inspector, contact our Manhattan office and we can connect you with our inspector in your area. You'll also find educational materials on our website to help you understand food safety requirements. I'd like to thank our colleagues in the Food Safety and Lodging Program and our agency communication staff, people who have been working behind the scenes to help bring this to you today. And thanks as well to Soul Fire Food, Poblano's Grill, and Flavor Wagon. They're three Topeka food trucks who allowed us to come in and shoot some of the photos in the presentation. Well, I hope over the last few minutes we've answered some of your questions about the challenges of mobile food operations. If you still have specific questions, continue to enter those in the Q&A, and we're going to answer those for you now. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adam Inman, and I'm the Assistant Program Manager for Food Safety and Lodging at the Kansas Department of Agriculture. And we, again, appreciate you taking the time today to join us as we discuss this topic. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dana Ladner, who uh, helps out our um, various stakeholders around the state with compliance assistance. So Dana, appreciate uh, you moderating our session today. Great, thank you, Adam. And what a great presentation today by our food safety team. We really appreciate everything that you have provided to us. And Pat, I wanna start off with a question to you. 
um, that was submitted in the Q&A. So uh, we kind of covered in the presentation, or maybe a little bit more information. Uh, the person uh, typing it in wanted to know if they have a three sync system, can that be back in the main home or restaurant rather than in the mobile unit to be able to help out with um, making sure that everything is cleaned up, ready to go? Thanks, Anna. Typically, you would want to make sure that your wear washing is done in the location in which you're licensed. However, you remember we were talking about commissaries. Now, your home could be a commissary, but it can't be the main kitchen. So if you have a three compartment system in your main kitchen that everybody goes to, then no, you can't take it back there. I would work with your operator or call into the office for additional information. Sounds to me like we have to determine a lot more information than just the question in of itself. But thanks for asking. You bet. It's always nice to have those, but the best part is we've got great inspectors that are willing to work with our license holders in the state of Kansas. Richard, I'm gonna throw this next question over to you. And it has to do um, with water again. If someone does not have a traditional hand washing sink for their tent stand, what should they do? Well, a hand washing sink of some sort is gonna be required. Uh, they do have portable hand sinks that you can take to your site and then you heat the hot water up and, and, main, and pour it into the reserve, reservoir tank uh, in the bottom of that sink. And if all else fails, you can heat water up and keep it stored in a thermal, about a five gallon jug that has a free flowing spigot and you could use that, but we have to make sure that that water stays at 100 degrees throughout your whole operation. Great, we've mentioned commissaries a couple different times. Michael, I'd like to get your input on this. Um, if someone is cooking in a commissary kitchen and then they take the food to a mobile unit, does the mobile unit need a license? Hey Dana, thanks. Yeah, the mobile unit is still going to require a license. There's still operations going on there that are critical for food safety, whether it's hot holding or cold holding, uh, hand washing as you're serving that product. Uh, one thing that may change is the category of licensing that mobile unit requires at that point. If you aren't cooking uh, raw animal products on the mobile unit, if you're cooking it in the commissary, uh, that may only then require say a category two license instead of a category one. Uh, there may be some subtle differences there, but. In the end, yes, that mobile unit's still going to need a license. Got it, great for that information, appreciate it. Pat, I wanna talk a little bit about thermometers. Um, let's say I have a dial thermometer. Can I use that one or do I need a digital thermometer? Yeah, dial thermometers have been used probably since the beginning of food safety when it comes down to needing to know what your temperatures are. Uh, dial thermometers are reliable in the fact that they don't rely on batteries. However, what is difficult with them is where that sensor is located. And since a lot of, a lot of our foods are thin, you need what's called a thin tip thermometer. That can be in a dial. Just know where your sensor is. If it's clear down at the bottom of that food probe, then great. But if it's halfway up the shaft, then you're going to need to figure out whether or not you want to go with the digital, which is much more reactive, very quick to find out what your temperature is. Your dial, it'll take a while for it to stabilize. So a uh, simple answer is yes, you can use a dial. Um, I, digital is maybe what you want because of time. All right, thanks on that. Pat, I want to stay with you for just a second. Do you have any suggestions on how to store sanitizer buckets in a mobile unit? Yeah, so you might be tempted to either keep it on the counter, but you might be doing prep there and you have food and you don't want it on that same counter. Um, if you're going to use spray bottles, spray bottles are real easy. If you have a uh, splash guard on the hand washing sink, you could just hang it on, on that. There's also a space. If you have a traditional hand washing sink, for instance, and it's attached to the wall there in your mobile unit, um, there's a space between the outer perimeter on that sink and the basin itself. It's about an inch, inch and a half, which means that you can actually attach something to the outside perimeter of that 
of that hand washing sink, like a towel bar of some kind, and then you can hang your spray bottles there, or you can actually attach a um, like a wire cage, some sort of a holder that holds your your um, bucket in that. I helped a mobile unit at one point in time suggested that, and I came back the next year and they said it was great. They loved it. Um, uh, it worked so well for them. And it was a small unit and they could get to it real quick, but they weren't kicking it if it was on the floor and it wasn't being up where the food is. And it was just, it, it was awesome. So don't, don't overlook that space. Great. Um, with that, Adam, I want to turn this over for you for just a second. We had someone um, submit a question in here uh, on licensing. And so if you could go ahead and take care of that for us, that'd be great. Sure. So we have a couple on licensing. And the first question was related to the COVID disaster here. And, and just that a bunch of the events that would typically operate at as a mobile unit were canceled. And how do we handle the licensing fees? And we are able to, um, if you look, reach out to us, email us at that kda.fsl at ks.gov, our main email. And just note that you're operating fewer than six days in these uh, licensing years. And we'll keep that in mind. We can roll your license fees over to the next year that you do operate. So we'll, we'll put your license inactive for this, for this time period. If you're not operating, more than six days in, in each license year. Um, so, yeah, we, we feel for you and we understand that that's a challenge and, and we're doing everything we can to help work with that. Um, then sort of a related licensing question about commissaries and licensing of those commissaries. So if anyone who, any operation, any person who's required to be licensed and is operating in a facility, like a shared use facility, as, as many commissaries can be, um, each person who's required to be licensed in that facility has to have their own license. So if you're just doing wear washing in a commissary, we don't require a license for that. But if you're doing food storage or food preparation in the commissary, then you would have to have a license in that commissary for your operation. Great, thanks on that. Our half hour has really blown through very, very quickly. Super, super information uh, covered by uh, our inspectors with that. Uh, we had someone ask about additional resources on offering food um, at their farm or from a tent or a food truck on those resources. And Adam, if you want to touch on that real briefly, but again, uh, we can also insert those links into the email that will be coming uh, to those that are registered with that uh, from today and make sure that that's included as well. Adam? Yeah, we should do that, but just briefly, um, same type of principles apply wherever you operate. So it'd probably just be maybe more convenient for you there at your farm, but probably the best thing is reach out to us and we'll connect you with the local inspector. We can have the inspector come out and do a planning visit with you and discuss all the options and, and help you get started on the right track as you make those types of plans. Great, with that, Autumn, I'll turn it over to you for any closing comments. Fabulous, thank you very much. Um, thank you for attending today's session. This recorded session will be posted soon on our website, along with the registration for our next month's webinar covering what food managers need to know. So look for that survey in your email inbox and um, to assist us in our planning of our future outreach sessions. Thanks so much.